beginning in chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, from the outset, Paul's going to mention a few names that you are going to be familiar with because they're names that he mentioned in uh, 1 Thessalonians as well. Uh, but in this uh, greeting that he gave to begin his letter, Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So a familiar greeting that he gives uh, in books, but we see that he specifically adds two names to his, and uh, these are names that, that we've heard before. Uh, Silvanus is Silas. Uh, uh, that's the same person. And so um, Silas, we know, was a long, dear friend, companion of Paul's. He traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey, which it was during that missionary journey that they started the church in Thessalonica, which is why Paul's now writing letters back to that young congregation. And uh, Silas was also with Paul when they were imprisoned in the Philippian jail, which we're familiar with that story. Silas was with Paul during that. And Silas was with him when they came and started the church in Thessalonica. So the Thessalonians were very familiar with uh, Silas. And uh, he worked with Paul on the letter that we studied the last month or two, 1 Thessalonians. And then we have Timothy as well. And we know Timothy to be Paul's just uh, uh, protege and, and companion in ministry, of course, uh, we, Timothy has an interesting background, uh, being from Galatia. His, his father was Greek. His, his mother uh, was Jewish, uh, Eunice. And from his youth, we know that he was taught scriptures uh, by his mother and his grandmother. Both played a very important role in his spiritual development. And, and, and we see that a lot today. Sometimes... Uh, a mother, a father, one of the two don't take a, a, a role in the spiritual development. It's just not something that's important to them. But, but thankfully, God brings others, whether it's a grandparent or, or another family member that, that, that is able to take that spiritual leadership role in a young person's life. Um, I love when, when aunts and uncles and grandparents bring kids from their family to church on Sundays, you know, and step in and, and, and fill a void that, that there may be in some homes. I love that. And, and, and that's what happened in Timothy's life uh, through his grandmother, especially. So he was taught scriptures, trusted companion of Paul, accompanied Paul on most of his mission trips. Paul had sent Timothy to Thessalonica on, on a previous occasion uh, and, of course, he was with Paul when they were in Thessalonica planning that church as well. So Thessalonica is very familiar with these three. They were all there in Thessalonica ministering to this church, so people that they knew. And so Paul mentions them as he addresses that they kind of collaborated with him as they send this letter. And, of course, uh, to the church in, uh, in Thessalonica... Uh, the church that they themselves founded uh, in the second missionary trip, which I already mentioned. And he's already written, this is a second letter back to them now. Uh, you can tell that he has a concern. This is a young church. He had just planted it. And so out of love and concern for them, he's writing letters back just to make sure everything is going well and to equip them uh, theologically and practically as well. And and I love this connection here because God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that combination, uh, uh, the Greek makes it very plain that these two are one source in the original language. Uh, and so he, he, Paul, in the way that he words this in the Greek, is very specific to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are unified as one, that they are from the same source. So again, reiterating the truth that we know of the trilogy, that, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, uh, even in the way that he greets them, emphasizes that, that truth in the original language. 
in a similar greeting, grace to you, peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a, a common greeting, and of course we know that, that peace can only come from who? <laughs> from God. Uh, people strive for peace in a lot of different ways, uh, but we know that true peace, lasting peace, ultimate peace can only come uh, through uh, Jesus Christ. And so we see that same combination here, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We see that same combination uh, combining those two, acknowledging they are both members of the Trinity in the same way. All right, three. Verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Uh, and so um, the, the idea is here, depending on your translation that you have, the ESV says we ought always, uh, some translations, we are bound to give thanks, uh, so Whichever translation you have, it definitely emphasizes the fact that, that Paul felt this obligation, this, he, was, he felt bound, that it was so fitting that he gives thanks to God for them because of their increasing faith um, uh, in the work. Ultimately, that he was thanking God because he knew that God was the source of, of this of this growth of their conversion, uh, that it was all God's work in their lives. So he's eager to, he feels obligated to thank God because of all the good things that he's hearing about them growing in the faith. And uh, Spurgeon says this, It is your duty to praise him. You are bound by the bonds of his love as long as you live to bless his name. It is met and comely that you should do so. It is not only a pleasurable exercise, it is the absolute duty of the Christian life to praise God. So this thanking him, praising him for what he's doing in this church, uh, Spurgeon is quick to say, this is our duty. Why did Paul feel obligated? Why did he feel bound to praise and thank God for his work in the church? It, it's our duty. It's, as, as God blesses, as God works, uh, our natural response should be to, to thank Him, to praise Him for what He's doing. And we, and we see why He thanked them, why He was thanking God for what He had heard. Their faith is growing, and it's even growing exceedingly or abundantly, depending on your translation. They are abounding in, in love, uh, or their love is increasing, whichever your translation says. And so we see uh, they, are, they are thriving. Uh, they are growing abundantly. Is, is, his wording there just really points to the fact that it is significant. It is vigorous growth. Um, again, I know I reference Spurgeon a lot, but he says good things. Uh, Spurgeon said this of strong and how to get strong and growing faith, um, which they were experiencing as a young church. By that means you are to grow. This is so with faith. Do all you can to grow and then do a little more. And when you can do that, then do a little more than you can. Always have something in hand that is greater than your present capacity. I love that line. Grow up to it, and when you have grown up to it, grow more. <laughs> uh, emphasizing the fact that, that none of us, they are growing abundantly. They're increasing. Uh, their, their faith is growing. Their trust in God is growing. Their knowledge of Scripture is growing. But as Spurgeon says, but don't stop there. Continue to grow. And I love this encouragement, and I love, that's, I, I love that you're here. Some of you, as we talked about, are, are few years older. <laughs> Some of you in your well into your 80s. But those of you well into your 80s and even 90s, I think. Right, GW? Is there still room to grow? At 91, is there still room to grow, GW? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and that is Spurgeon. Continue to grow. Strive to grow. Uh, 
Just because you've been in church for 70 years doesn't mean that there aren't ways that you can continue to grow in your faith. And so, yes, they're growing, but we know that there is still more room to grow. And that is, uh, therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. And so, what, what a great thing to have said about this young church, that they are steadfast in their faith, even though they are dealing with persecution, even though they are dealing with uh, afflictions. Uh, what, a, what a word that, that, uh, of encouragement to them. Um, because uh, this idea is going to be a theme this Sunday as we look at the life of Daniel, that he continued, despite all the afflictions, despite all the persecutions, Daniel was just steadfast in his faith. Uh, When he was thrown in the lion's den, he was 85, uh, around 85, uh, and, and just through his life, steadfast in his faith, despite all the afflictions that he was enduring. Uh, and this church is proving uh, to be the same. Verse 5, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Uh, which, <laughs> this is an interesting phrase. It talks about their affliction. It talks about their persecution. And then Paul says, this is evidence <laughs> of God. Which most would think, I'm going through all this. It must, where is God? Is what we think. And what Paul's saying is, man, the persecution you're going through, uh, all the 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 trials you're going through, that is evidence of of God, Um, because God is at work uh, purifying His believers. How do you purify metal? You add a little heat. Uh, Heat purifies. those metals. And so uh, what they're going through, what they are enduring is actually helping them to to grow uh, in their faith, these tribulations that they are dealing with. We think God is absent when we go through difficult times, uh, but uh, Paul Paul said the opposite, that God is going, God's work uh, can be most evident Oftentimes, as we go through difficulties in life, and those can be times that we actually uh, grow uh, because of uh, of our dependence on God during those difficult times. And that persecution, uh, that helps us to be considered worthy of the kingdom of God as we suffer. Um, that I went out, sorry. Um, Paul's prayer was that the worthiness of, of Christ and his suffering may be accounted to, to them. Uh, not that they are earning something. They're not earning salvation by their suffering. Uh, but they are uh, definitely um, partnering with Christ in his suffering as they endure persecution as, as well. Verse 6, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflicted you. Uh, Again, do we seek vengeance? Do we seek to afflict those that afflict us? No, but uh, that is God's role, not ours. And so as we see here, uh, God can repay, God can judge that all belongs to, to God, not us. Retribution is not something that we seek, um, but uh, we can uh, entrust God to handle those situations. And so, um, since indeed God considers it just to replay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so the Thessalonian church, as they were going through persecution, as they were going through tribulations, as Paul just mentioned, uh, God gets his glory. And this time of persecution, this time of affliction will not last. Uh, A day of rest, a day of relief is coming. It's coming for all of us. That's the hope we all have. Uh, Despite what's going on in this life, 
Uh, rest is coming. Uh, relief is coming. Uh, ultimately, it will be uh, here for all of us when, when Christ returns and Jesus is revealed from heaven with the mighty angels. Uh, relief is on the way, and it, it, is, it is close, <laughs> uh, um, it, getting closer each day. Verse 8, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see uh, relief is coming for one group who have placed their faith in Christ, but as relief comes for one group, judgment is coming for another group. And we see that judgment here uh, to unbelievers, and we see um, this day of judgment, uh, what it's going to be like. Uh, this is those persecuting the church. This is what end is theirs. Rest is coming for us. Uh, judgment is coming for them. And uh, it's described as in flaming fire. We often, if you do word association, sometimes you think of hell, you think of fire, right? <laughs> That's just kind of the description that comes to mind because it's often mentioned. But uh, fire isn't what makes hell so bad. Fire's not pleasant. If you've been burned, being burned is terrible. Uh, that's a, a pain that is unlike a lot of pains. Uh, but uh, it is not the fire that makes hell what it is. It is being separated from God is what makes hell what it is. It's often described in, in flames and all of that, but the ultimate reality is hell is what it is because it's, it's being apart from uh, the presence of the Lord. And so that's what makes hell so bad. And, uh, and, and in this description, it's described as fire. And they will suffer the punishment, being separated from God, away from the presence of the Lord. And the punishment is an eternal destruction uh, Paul says, or an everlasting destruction. Um, just as heaven is eternal, hell is eternal as well. There are some that teach annihilationism, that, uh, that, that you're burned, you know, that you just cease to exist. Uh, but uh, I believe there's a clear teaching in Scripture that as eternal as heaven is, uh, so is, is hell as well, and I believe this points to that in the eternal destruction, as Paul says, of of hell. Um, there are some liberal uh, theologians and 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 folks that believe that that hell is only remedial; it's temporary, but ultimately everyone gets to heaven. Uh, but I, I don't see anything temporary in. Uh, a punishment of eternal destruction. That doesn't seem temporary to me. Uh, it seems pretty everlasting. Away from the presence of the Lord. Again, that's what makes hell hell. Fire is terrible, but it's being away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. In verse 10, when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. And so we see... Again, that day of judgment is going to be a different experience <laughs> for these two groups of people. Uh, we have eternal punishment on that day of judgment, but on that day, uh, we who have believed will marvel uh, on that day uh, as, as, as He comes to be glorified in His saints. Uh, there's going to be a, a definite uh, different response from those two groups. And uh, we've believed, and then he says, because our testimony to you was believed. Um, testimonies are strong things, and it's, uh, and it's um, Paul knew what it was like to be transformed from a, a persecutor to persecuted as his road to Damascus experience, and he believed the testimony of Jesus Christ and 
He knew the transformation. Again, he's addressing persecutors as those who will suffer, but he knows what it's like to come from persecutor to persecuted uh, and has that testimony even in his life. Verse 11, to this end, we will always pray for you. Again, what's the church in Thessalonica going through? Persecution. Uh, They're going through a difficult time. And Paul is reiterating here, we will always pray for you. He's encouraging that he is uh, praying for them, that he will continue to pray for them. Uh, And he says, we, so all the companions, all those that he is talking to, he is making sure that there are many praying for this young church as they endure this persecution. Uh, And praying for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. And so, again, he's praying that God will continue to work uh, in their lives uh, to fulfill his purposes for them, uh, and that can only come through the power of God and the Holy Spirit in their lives. And ultimately, he's praying that they will live worthy of their calling. And that is a prayer for all of us, that we will live in a manner worthy of the calling uh, uh, that we have as sons and daughters of God, uh, that, that he will work in our lives, in our hearts, in our character, so that we will be worthy of, of being called his children and, and live in light of that. So that The name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified. Why do we want to live a life that's worthy of our calling? So that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified. Uh, We don't do it uh, for recognition by man. We do it so that the name of Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We live lives... uh, of integrity. We live lives of, of good work. We live lives of faith. We do all of those things ultimately so that the name of Jesus will be glorified. And that ends this uh, first chapter of, of Second Thessalonians. And uh, there are two more chapters after this. Um, Next one's a little bit longer, so we may take a few more moments, but um, uh, I hope uh, a word of encouragement to you because ultimately this is, this is our prayer, that we will be worthy of our calling um, so that God will be glorified through us as individuals and also through us as a church as well. All right, well, let's pray to that end as we close this morning. Father, we... We pray as, as a church, as Westside, that we will be worthy of our calling. As, as individuals, Father, may we be worthy of our calling. Uh, may we live lives of integrity and, and faith and love so that you will be glorified. And Father, is so that ultimately... It will be a, a, a tool to bring you glory and also an opportunity to reach lost people so they will see the difference that Christ has made in our lives and that you'll be glorified by, by folks coming to a saving relationship with you through, through us living in a way that's worthy of our calling. Father, we pray, uh, we pray for our world today. We often don't think globally, but Father, there is unrest all around our world. And Father, we pray for uh, Ukraine and Russia. We pray for ongoing difficulties in in Israel. There are just a number of things uh, that that we see on the news that, Father, we ultimately pray uh, for revival uh, worldwide. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.